السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. begin with the recitation of the Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. عما يتساءلون عن النبأ العظيم الذي هم فيه مختلفون كلا سيعلمون ثم كلا سيعلمون ألم نجعل الأرض مهادا والجبال أوتادا وخلقناكم أزواجا وجعلنا نومكم سباتا وجعلنا الليل لباسا وجعلنا النهار معاشا وبنينا فوقكم سبعا شدادا وجعلنا سراجا وهاجا وأنزلنا من المعصرات ماء ثجاجا لنخرج به حبا ونباتا وجنات ألفافا إن يوم الفصل كان ميقاتا يوم ينفخ في الصور فتأتون أفواجا وفتحت السماء فكانت أبوابا وسيرت الجبال فكانت سرابا إن جهنم كانت مرصادا للطاغين مآبا لابثين فيها أحقابا لا يذوقون فيها بردا ولا شرابا إلا حميما وغساقا جزاء وفاقا إنهم كانوا لا يرجون حسابا وكذبوا بآياتنا كذابا وكل شيء أحصيناه كتابا فذوقوا فلن نزيدكم إلا عذابا إن للمتقين مفازا حدائق وأعنابا وكواعب أترابا وكأسا دهاقا لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا جزاء ربك عطاء حسابا رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا ذلك اليوم الحق فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه مآبا إنا أنذرناكم عذابا قريبا يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يداه ويقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم وأبارك على سيدي وحبيبي وقائدي محمد بن عبد الله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه إلى يوم الدين من اهتدى فلا مضل له 
ومن يضلل الله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It gives me great joy and honor to stand here before you to share something with you about a hereafter about a place which if it wasn't for that place that Allah had promised us I don't think any of us will be working in Islam for anything or maybe none of us would have hope but only live with fear fear from hellfire Allah created heaven Jannah and a Muslim lives a life not only in fear but a life between hope and fear we live in hope hoping that Allah will forgive us and give us mercy and we enter that everlasting dwelling in Jannah paradise and we fear Allah from doing sins because we remember hellfire and we ask Allah to save us from hellfire and so a Muslim lives a life of hope, a life of hope Raja and khawf, fear of hellfire. Brothers and sisters, I have a question for you. What do you wish for? What do you wish for? What do you desire? What do you anticipate to reach? What do you anticipate to reach, brothers and sisters? What is it that you yearn for? What is it that you long for? What is it? Ask yourself that question. What is your ambition? Do you wish for a beautiful wife or a gorgeous husband who has got popularity, who everyone looks up to so that you can show off with him or her? Do you desire a beautiful mansion and lots of money? Is that what you desire? Or do you anticipate to reach a firm, lifelong career? Do you anticipate that? Do you yearn for luxurious dwelling, a land, or probably one day to buy an island of your own? Do you long for, do you long for fame and popularity and fortune? What do you yearn for? What do you desire? What do you desire? Do you miss having all of that? If this is what you are desiring and anticipating for and yearning for, then my dear brother or sister, you have been deceived. You have been deceived by this world, all of its fortune, all of its beauty. Because this beauty which you see in front of you, as Allah describes it in the Quran, is like a flower that grows in the ground. It gets watered from the rain and then it blossoms. It has a nice fragrance and it looks beautiful. But then it only lasts for about a month or less. And then suddenly it starts to wither away. And you have no more attention towards it. As if it never had existed before. And becomes soil and dirt. Allah says in the Quran, I'lamu, know, understand, acknowledge. Learn this, understand this always, be conscious about it. That, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Know that this worldly life, الحياة الدنيا, is only playing, لعب, له, entertaining yourselves. زينة, decoration. تفاخر بينكم, challenging each other. Who can get the best house? Who can get the fastest cars? Who can look the most beautiful? Who can have more money? Tafakhurun baynakum, Allah says. And this is what the world of life is about. Don't the kuffar do that? Trying to rise in the high levels and positions in work? Yes, they do. And everyone tries to beat everyone else in becoming or reaching that high seat? Yes, it is a life of challenge, challenging each other. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And people love in this life to have lots of money. 
lots of children in order to have a strong back. Like that flower which I gave an example to. This world is like that. It blossoms for a little bit and then it fades away, brothers and sisters. If this is what you are yearning for, longing for, missing, and being anxious about, I'm sad to say, brothers and sisters, that you are in a very great loss because when you die, and we all shall die, you're just going to have to leave it all behind you. Subhanallah. All of that, we're going to leave it behind us. Yes, it's not going to be buried with you. The only thing that you'll be taking is two things. Your family and your actions to the graveyard. But your family will go back and your actions will stay with you. And then it'll be an ugly being if your actions are bad to keep you in that bad company until the Day of Judgment or it will be the most handsome person to sit with you and keep you company until the Day of Judgment. So what do you yearn for and desire? When we read about the companions of the past, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example about how they lived and what they yearned for and anticipated and desired. I have chosen a topic called Al-Mushtaquna ilal Jannah which means those who desire paradise, not those who desire this world. And I give you examples of the companions of the Prophet in a short while and people who lived before us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, Bismillahir rahmanir rahim, wa sabiquna sabiquna ulaika al muqarrabun. وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ فِي جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ ثُلَّةٌ مِّنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنَ الْآخِرِينَ And those who have passed us, those who have passed us, Allah says. The ones who have beaten us. Beaten us. أُولَئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ They are the ones closer to Allah. Where? Fi Jannat in Naim, in high places in Jannah, blessed. Thullatum min al awwalin, a large amount from the people before us. Wa qalilun min al akhirin, and only a small amount of them still exist in the after time, meaning in our time. Who are the Sabiqun brothers and sisters from the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? His companions and the ones after them, they are the Sabiqun. They have beaten us in two things. They are the Sabiqun, meaning they are before us. And they are the sabiqun, meaning they have beaten us to paradise. And there is a small amount from this life, Allah says. There's only a minority that are still striving and working and desiring paradise and have left this world. Only a small amount, Allah says. A sabiqun, a sabiqun. Allah is praising the ones who race each other. Sibaq means race. Race, Allah says, is praising the people who race each other for the goodness, not racing each other for worldly things. No. As sabiqun, as sabiqun, Allah says, and those who can beat other people in what? In good deeds. To beat each other to paradise, to beat each other in high places in paradise. No, a normal Muslim does not want just the first place in paradise. A mu'min wants to beat everyone and go to the Firdaus al-A'la. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, تَمَنَّوا وَاسْأَلُوا الْفِرْدَوْسَ الْأَعْلَى When you ask Allah for Jannah, ask Him for the highest place, which is called Al-Firdaus. Because these are the qualities of the believers. The believers are sabiqun, musbiqun, yatasabaqun. They always race each other for goodness. There existed two people which the Prophet ﷺ told us about in the time of the Prophet. And they used to challenge each other in everything they did. They loved each other for the sake of Allah. And they tried to pray and beat each other in prayer. So they pray night prayers and they would fast more days. When this friend heard about his brother, that he would fast two days, his brother would fast three days. When he heard about him, that he was fasting. Every Mondays and Thursdays, the other brother would fast day on, day off. When he donated from his wealth this much, the other brother would beat him and donate that much. One day they went out to jihad. She's fighting a battle against people who were attacking the Muslims. Attacking the, oppressing, attacking the oppressed ones. 
driving people out of their homes. So they thought this is a great chance to reach the highest places in paradise because Allah loves those who defend the weak. So they set out and they began to fight in the battle until they lost each other. Then one of them was a captive. And those oppressors' enemies, they caught this captive. And they said to him, they began to torture him. And torture him. And every time they tortured him, he began to laugh. And the mushrikeen said, why are you laughing? We're torturing you. You're a captive. He said, I am laughing because Alhamdulillah, I am going to die a shaheed and beat my brother to Jannah. That's it. I've beaten him. And they said, what the? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you Muslims? The same person like you we caught before, he said the same thing before he died. And then he started to cry. But he still died. And Allah says that they met each other in paradise. Al-Mushtaquna ilal Jannah, those who desire paradise, work for it. They strive for it. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described a mu'min in this life and he said, Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. It is the prison of a mu'min, of a believer, and it is the paradise of a kafir, one who rejects Allah. Yes, it is a paradise because they believe that this is the only life they're going to live. It's only one life, they say, it's a short life, so we might as well make the best of it. Get as much as we can from it. A mu'min doesn't think that way. He sees that everything in this world always calls him and her to doing haram things. It makes it difficult for us to worship Allah correctly and sincerely. It makes it difficult, especially in our time today, where the Prophet ﷺ said, there will come a time when the one who is holding on to his religion is like one who is holding on to a coal of fire. It's intense. It's difficult, brothers and sisters. But it is not difficult upon the one who anticipates a great reward in the hereafter. La wallah, abadan. Imagine you are a prisoner, or imagine you are an outcast, a stowaway, and you're stuck on an island. Or you are in a strange land, you have no family, you have no food, you have no water, and you just anticipate to getting back to your family, back to your home. Imagine what kind of a feeling that type of a person would be feeling when he is in that strange land, imprisoned, encaged. He will do anything and struggle in any way just to get back to his family, get back to his home, get back to security, wouldn't he? Sometimes even if it meant his life. If he's drowning and he is stuck in the water, he will struggle and strive in every way. Even if it meant that he has to use the last piece of energy and breath that he has in order to reach land. Ad-dunya sijn al-mu'min. The world is like a prison for a mu'min. A mu'min. One who desires Allah. One who desires paradise. That's a mu'min. Are you one of them, brothers and sisters? If you desire paradise, then you work for it. And we, some people think that if you worship Allah, you should not work desiring paradise. You should only work because you desire Allah only. But this is wrong and this is not the aqeedah of a Muslim. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَعْبُدُونَهُ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا They worship Allah in hope and in fear. طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا وَطَمْعًا And also greedy for Jannah. Because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if their companion was in need, you would find that one of them, subhanAllah, the one typical companion would always put his brother in his place. Allah says in the Quran, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا And they would deny themselves things when they themselves needed it in order to provide it for their brothers in Islam. Yes, if they were attacked by some people, they would go out and they would beat each other to the battlefield to defend the women and the children. Not only that, the companions would race each other 
And he would find in those days, read the seerah, a companion would grab his brother from behind in his shirt and he would pull him to the back, throwing him behind him. Why? Because he says to his brother, Wallahi, you will not die before me. I will defend you instead of you defending me. I will not let you defend me. I am not better than you. This is how they were. They loved each other to that extent because they loved paradise and they wanted to meet in paradise. There was a woman called Mashitat Fir'aun. She was a woman who was the hairdresser of Fir'aun's daughter, Pharaoh, who said, I did not know any God but me. And Mashitat Fir'aun, this hairdresser, she had embraced Islam in secret. And when she was combing the hair of the daughter of Pharaoh, the king, the one who said he is a God, the comb fell to the ground. And then she automatically, unconsciously picked up the comb and said, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And this Mashtat Fir'aun, this hairdresser, had five children. And one of them was still breastfeeding. And then the daughter of Fir'aun said, Allah, Abi, are you saying Allah, my father? And she said, no. Allah, the father of Allah, the God of your father and yourself and me. And she became angry. She went to her father and said to him, Father, this woman worships another God beside you. He said, what? She know another God beside me? Who is there? Call her to me. And they called her to him. And then she came and stood a woman, a woman, brothers and sisters, in front of this great Pharaoh. And he said to her, who is your God? And she said, Allah is my Lord. He said, who is Allah? He said, Allah Rabbi wa Rabbuk. Allah is my God and yours. Yes, when she was cornered and put in the place, when she had to answer, she answered. She answered. And this is how the state of the mu'mins in the past and present are. When they said, Rabbi Allah, Allah is my Lord, they were tortured. But we don't care. Because we know what we are heading towards. We know who our Lord is. And we say what we believe. We are not liars. She said, Allahu Rabbi wa Rabbuk. And then he said, what? Bring the chains. They brought the chains. They began to punish her and whip her. Who is your Lord? And she would say, Allahu Rabbi wa Rabbuk. And so he ordered for them to bring a large container. And then he spilled hot boiling oil into this container. Large container. Like a swimming pool. And then he said, bring me all of her children. And they brought them one by one. He said, worship me, I am your God. She said, never. So he brought her first son and he threw him into the oil. In front of her eyes, his meat and his flesh fell off his body. And then his bone disintegrated. Then they brought her next son and she was firm, Allahu Akbar. And they burnt him. She could not stop him. And then her third and then her fourth. Then finally her fifth, he was on her arm and she was about to pull back. She was about to pull back in front of the eyes of all the people. When all of a sudden, and this is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, when all of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above seven skies made her child or infant speak while she was in the cradle. And he said, Isbiri ya ummati, isbiri ya ummi, isbiri ya ummi, innaki ala al-haq. Be patient my mother, you are on the truth. Inna Allah qad wa'adaki bi jannah. Allah, Allah has promised you with a great heaven. Keep going, mother. And then they threw her son into the boiling oil. And then she was next. She knew that she was going to die. And then she began to cry. And Pharaoh said, why are you crying? Stop. And she said, I want crying because I want to ask you to do something for me. I don't know if you will do it. He said, ask me for whatever you like. He said, once you throw me into the oil, then I want you to gather whatever is remaining of our bodies and I want you to bury us together in the same grave. Because I want to be resurrected with my children and I want to go to Jannah with my children. I don't want them to go out of my arms. And she knew what this life was and what the hereafter was. And so they threw her in the, into the oil and she ended up in Jannah. Just like that man, that prophet, who Allah does not mention his name in the Quran, in Surah Yaseen. And a man came from the far end of the Medina. Yasa, meaning running towards them. 
He said, Oh my people, follow the messengers. Follow the ones who do not ask you for any wealth. They're not asking you for any wealth or any ajar, any exchange. And they are the ones who are rightly guided. What did they do to him? They brought him as in the hadith. And then they put a hole into the ground. And they dug him into the ground and then chopped his head off. In another hadith, they threw him down the well and they killed him. And then Allah resurrected him and put him straight into Jannah. And Allah says in the Quran, and then he replied by calling out, Ya layta qawmi ya'lamun bima ghafrani rabbi wa ja'alani min al mukramin He called out and says, Oh, woe if only my people had known how Allah has forgiven me and what kind of a blessing he has put me in. Jannah, na'im, everlasting, everlasting luxury. Everlasting freedom, everlasting bliss. If only my people knew where I have ended up. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad, ma yatihim min rasul illa kanu bihi astahzioon. Oh, great sorrow and sadness to the people, servants of Allah. There isn't a messenger that comes to them, warning them, and promising them, except that they would mock him. And this is our state today. What about Imraat Fir'aun, Pharaoh's wife? She also embraced Islam in secret. And when Pharaoh found out, he brought her, as in the Quran, Firaun, and the wife of Pharaoh. In the hadith it says, he brought her. And then he stripped her naked. And he hung her, in the, he hung her to, to the ceiling from her breasts. And he began to torture her. He tortured her and tortured her and she began to cry. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَرْيَمْ He said, وَمْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ She said, Oh my Lord, what she was being tortured. Oh Allah, build for me a palace in Jannah and save me from Pharaoh and save me from the people who are oppressors. The hadith says, while she was being tortured, Allah showed her a palace inside of Jannah and she began to laugh and Pharaoh began to torture her even more, saying, what is making her laugh? Torture her more. Isn't she feeling this? And she died laughing. Little did he know that Allah was showing her place, her palace in Jannah, which made her forget the pain. It was too overwhelming. And she died seeing her palace and she died going into Jannah. وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ Those who beat us, my dear brothers and sisters. What were they like? They sacrificed their wealth. Their wealth, my dear brothers, they sacrificed their wealth for Jannah. How? How can you buy this world with your money and sell the hereafter for a few pennies or a few dollars which you can earn in this life? Why? How? How could you buy this worthless life when the Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-dunya, this whole world, وَمَا فِيهَا لَا تُسَاوِي عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةً It is not worth a wing of a mosquito to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَوْ كَانَتْ تُسَاوِي عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةً If it were to work, be worth the wing of a mosquito, لَمَا سَقَ اللَّهُ مِنْهَا الْكَافِرُ شُرْبَ تَمَاءً Allah would have never let the one who rejects him drink a drop of its water if it was worth the wing of a mosquito. And there are a lot of Muslims who place the world on their head like a crown. When the companions used to place the, the, the world in their hands and their religion like a crown. If, what is in the, if, if their crown went out of place, they would put what was in their hands on the ground. So the hereafter was on their head and when it went out of place, they dropped the dunya and they fixed their religion. Today it's the opposite, my dear brothers and sisters. Today it's the opposite. They sacrificed their wealth. There was a time, my dear brothers and sisters, a story of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar. Umar radiallahu anhu used to always try to beat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because this was their quality. They always were jealous of each other when someone did better good deeds. Not jealous of each other when someone had more money or beauty or a voice or whatever. And they would love each other and try to beat each other for that. So one day the Muslims were in need and they were in great poverty. And the Prophet ﷺ called the Muslims to bring what they have of wealth if they are able to do so. 
So Umar radiallahu anhu said, today wallahi I'm going to beat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So he went to his house and he said, I'm going to take half of everything that I have in my house. And so even the earrings, he took one earring and left another earring for his wife. His wealth, he split it in half, everything. And he held a large baggage on top of his shoulder and he walked with them. On his way, he saw Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he was only carrying a small amount. And he said, Alhamdulillah, today I have beaten him. Yes, this is how they raced each other. When they reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Umar radiallahu anhu, what have you left for your family? Have you looked after them? He said, yes, ya Rasulullah, I've left half of my wealth. He said, barakallahu fika ya Umar. Then he turned to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, what have you left for your family, Abu Bakr? You have brought a very small amount. He said, taraktu lahum Allahu wa rasuluh. He said, I left for them Allah and his messenger. I left for them Allah and his messenger. He left nothing but Allah and his messenger. They will look after them. Subhanallah. And that's when Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Laytani, I wish that I were a hair on the chest of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. La ilaha illallah. What about Mus'ab ibn Umair? Who resembled the Prophet sallallahu in his appearance and character. Who the Prophet sallallahu looked at him and knew that he has a beautiful tongue. So he sent him to Medina. He was the one who went to Medina. And when the Prophet sallallahu migrated from Mecca to Medina, he found 88,000 people from Medina that were singing Tala al-Badru alayna min thaniyat al-wada. Where did they come from? From Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. Before Islam, he was the wealthiest. Before Islam, he was the most handsomest. Before Islam, he used to look after himself that he used to put so much cologne and would look after himself so much that the women of Mecca, when they smelt his perfume, they would stand in a line to wait for him to pass, wanting to attract him. Yes, this was Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. When he embraced Islam, he donated everything he had of his wealth in the cause of those who are more in need. And then in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of Uhud, Mus'ab ibn Umayr fighting like a lion, defending the Muslims, defending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When a spear attacked him, it struck him and then swords one by one until he had over 70 stabbings and he fell to the ground. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions after the battle was over, he came to bury the Muslimin, the Mujahideen, the Shuhada. And then when they looked at Mus'ab ibn Umayr, they searched through his wealth and he did not find anything with his wealth to cover him. All they could find in his house was a piece of cloth to wrap him up in, the kafan. And when they would cover his head, his feet would show. And when they would cover his feet, his head would show. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bakhim bakh ya Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Oh Mus'ab ibn Umayr. We did not find anything of the wealth just to cover your whole body and bury you in. You donated it all for those who were in need. In Jannah is where we shall meet. Al Firdaus al A'la, my dear brothers and sisters. And many, many more of them. Brothers and sisters, their love for paradise made them do the most amazing things. They made them honorable and kings and the most wealthiest, even though in money they didn't have much. They were kings, even though they did not wear crowns and cloaks made of silk and wool of the most expensive type. They were kings and honorable and happy, even though they did not have what normal people anticipate for and think of it to be happiness. Naam, their sadness disappeared when they knew their lost ones made it to paradise. If someone died from their family, it was enough for them, for their sadness to go away when they knew that they had ended up in paradise. This is the story of Haritha radiallahu anhu. Haritha radiallahu anhu and his mother, Ummu Haritha. He wanted to go out one time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also in one of the battles. And remember my brothers and sisters, the Muslims never fought a battle when they started it. They only fought battles after the enemies had taken, driven them out of their lands and massacred their children and raped their women. Haritha radiallahu anhu, between the age of 20 and 25, 
He came with the Prophet ﷺ to go out into jihad for the first time. And his mother had prepared him to follow the Prophet ﷺ. And then when they went out, my dear brothers and sisters, the Muslimin arrived to a certain place where there was a well. A well. And one of the where there was a well. So the Prophet ﷺ said to one of the, one of the Sahaba to go and, and protect that well at night when the Muslims are asleep. So that no one can come to that well and take it over from the enemies. And then in the middle of the night, when the Sahaba was protecting that well, all of a sudden Harith woke up. He woke up to go to the well to drink because he was extremely thirsty when he was asleep. And then when he reached the cliff, he was about to go down into the well. This Sahaba, he looked up into the cliff and he thought it was one of the enemies coming to take over the well. And so he armed his arrow and targeted towards him. And then he speared him. And the arrow struck Haritha radiallahu anhu right in his chest. And then he fell to the ground. And then this Sahaba raced towards him in order to see who it was. And then, to his sadness and sorrow and to his shock, he found that it was Haritha radiallahu anhu. A Muslim had mistakenly killed another Muslim. And as Haritha was dying, he said, La ilaha illallah. And his soul escaped from his body. The Muslims found out the, 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 uh, the story and they went and they had their battle and then they returned back to the Muslimin. And then Umm Haritha came along, his mother, searching for her son. When she saw all the soldiers returning back, she would look at that person and look at this person to see if it was Haritha. But every time she went from one companion to another, it was someone else. And then she grabbed one of the companions and she said to him, My son, my son, where is my son? Is he a shaheed? Is he a martyr? Was he killed in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then the companions would say, Your son Haritha, no, he wasn't in the battle. He wasn't in the front lines. No, he wasn't killed. Shaheed, I don't think he is a shaheed. And she began to cry and scream. And she said, show me where the Prophet Sallallahu is. And when she found him, she grabbed the Prophet, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said to him, Ya Rasool Allah, Qulli tell me, my son Haritha, is he in Jannah? Is he in Jannah? Or is he not? Wallahi, if you tell me that he is not in Jannah, you will see what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn this world upside down. This is what a mother feels, ya akhwan. Yes, a mother who understands Jannah and paradise, she wants her son to reach the highest place. But of course, in a worthy cause. Ya Rasulullah, tell me. And if it is not in paradise, you will see what I will do. Then the Prophet Sallallahu looked at her and he yelled and he said, Ya Ummu Haritha, ahabilti, ahabilti Ya Ummu Haritha. Have you gone mad Ya Ummu Haritha? Have you lost your mind? Inna Haritha qad mata shaheedan wa inna Haritha qad asab al-firdaws al-a'la. Inna ha jinan, inna ha jinan wa inna Haritha fil firdaws al-a'la. He said, are you crazy O Ummu Haritha? Haritha died, a martyr in Islam, and he is not only in Jannah, it is many Jannat, it is many paradises, and he has targeted the highest place in Al Firdaus Al A'la. Now, because he died with a sincere and proper intention. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters, they sacrificed their lusts and their temptations also in love for paradise. This is another story of a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu a young boy at the age of about 16 or 17. His name is Thalaba radiallahu anhu. Thalaba radiallahu anhu was one of the active youth in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu who obeyed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his heart was firm in the belief of the Qur'an and he was completely convinced in the existence of Allah and he anticipated and, died and, and, and sacrificed everything to reach Jannah. The Prophet Sallallahu once sent Sa'thalaba on an errand, meaning he sent him to do something. And then Tha'laba went. It only would have taken him half a day to complete this errand. When on his way, Tha'laba was on his way back to the Prophet Sallallahu when he reached close to Medina, and he was passing by a small village which was built of small tents. And then he heard one of the tents as though there was water being spilt inside, like a shower, as though there was something, someone bathing in there. Thalaba did not have the right to open that tent and to look who was inside of there. However, his lust, his hormones played up a bit at that time. And the shaitan 
deluded him into opening a tiny crack in that tent. And he looked inside and accidentally, to his shock, saw a naked woman bathing. Now, he saw a naked woman bathing. As his temptations and lusts and hormones began to rise, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he threw the, then he closed the tent and he screamed so high and so, he yelled so loud that he said, What have I done? La ilaha illallah. Allah will now send a verse down to the Prophet Sallallahu saying that I am one of the hypocrites. Because at that time the Quran was being sent down. He said, Wallahi la yadhkurin illa yadhkuran illahu ma'al munafiqeen. Allah is now going to mention me one of the hypocrites. How could I worship Allah and then go and look into a to see a naked woman in her tent? How can I say that I am a mu'min? Allah is surely going to say that I am one of the hypocrites. Say, Yadhkurani Allahu ma'al munafiqeen. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. And he forgot all about returning back to the Prophet ﷺ, who was too scared. He did not want to hear anything because it was almost certain that there was a verse sent down in the name of Thalaba. He is a munafiq. So instead of going to the Prophet ﷺ, he ran away and he headed towards the cliffs. And he stayed up there. When he didn't return to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet began to become worried. And he said, Where is Thalaba? I hope nothing has happened to him. The next day came and Thalaba hadn't, hadn't returned. So we sent his companions outside to look for him. And when they went and they tried and they returned, they said, Ya Rasulullah, we don't know where he is. And they kept the search going for about a week. Until finally the Prophet ﷺ sent Abu Bakr and Umar for a special task to look for him and find him. He said, go, look out into the outskirts of Medina, into the cliffs and the hills, into the forests and in the trees, search every tent, ask anyone that you see and search for Thalaba. I'm very worried about Thalaba. And so they went out and it took them weeks to search for him until finally they approached this village where they found a shepherd with his goats. And they approached him and said, have you seen a young man? His descriptions are so and so. He is of this height and his name is Thalaba. He said, are you asking about the crying boy? They said, what crying boy? He said, the boy that weeps a lot. There is a young boy that sits up in those cliffs over there. Our village hears him every night crying. And we don't know what his matter is. Every day he comes down and he drinks a bit of milk from my goats and then he would drag himself back up into the mountains. And they said, this is surely Thalaba. So Abu Bakr and Umar went up to the mountain and they searched for him until they found him, sheltered away underneath leaves. His clothes were, were torn apart. He was withered away, he was so skinny. There was a disease in his skin and he was extremely sick. They thought that he was dying. So then they grabbed him. And as soon as Thalaba saw them, as though terror had happened to him, as if the angel of death came to him. He tried to struggle and run away, but they chased him and caught him. And then they grabbed him. And he said, please, please, don't take me to the Prophet Don't take me to him. Don't take me to him. I'm too scared. They said, what is wrong with you? Take a hold of yourself, Ya Thalaba. He said, please don't take me to him. I know, what you are, I know why you are taking me to him. Allah has sent a verse down concerning me, hasn't he? He certainly has sent a verse down concerning me, hasn't he? He said, Ya Thalaba, we don't know why the Prophet ﷺ is asking for you. Please come with us. He said, yes, I know why. I know why. They said, Wallahi, we have to take you to him. It is a commandment from the Prophet. And so they dragged him on his feet towards the Prophet ﷺ. And they placed him in his house. And they told him, Thalaba is at his home. So the Prophet ﷺ came to him. And he kneeled down and kissed him on his forehead. And he said to him, Ya Thalaba, what is wrong? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, are you hiding it from me? He said, what am I hiding? He said, Allah has sent down the verse concerning me that I am one of the hypocrites, hasn't he? The Prophet ﷺ looked at him and he was crying. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, No, Ya Thalaba, Allah has not sent anything in your cause. And then he said, I am going to be punished, Ya Rasulullah. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Thalaba, min madha takhaf? What are you fearing? And he said, I fear that Allah is going to place me into the lowest place of hellfire. I did a great sin, Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Atakhafu min ghadabillah? Are you fearing the anger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, walakinna al-mu'mana yarju. A mu'min also has another belief, and that is hope. Mada tarju ya thalaba? What do you hope for? What do you wish for? What do you yearn for? And he said, Inni arju rahmat Allah. I hope for the mercy of Allah and His forgiveness. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Fasal Allah bima tarju. Then ask Allah with that which you are hoping for. Wa ij'al al-zann billah habillah hasan. And make your assumption about Allah good. You will find it. And then he made a dua, and the Prophet ﷺ read on his head and made a dua for him. Then all of a sudden, Thalaba said, Ya Rasulullah, I feel as though there are thousands of ants crawling on my body. He said to him, ذَلِكَ يَا ثَعْلَبَ Can you really feel that? And he said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. And I'm about to go unconscious. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, إِنَّهُ الْمَوْتُ قَدْ نَزَلَ بِكَ يَا ثَعْلَبَ فَقُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ It is death. It is now. Come and struck on you. You are dying, Ya Thalaba. So say, La ilaha illallah. And then Thalaba began to repeat those words. He said, Say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And he repeated those words until finally his soul escaped from his body. He was forgiven. But because, my dear brothers and sisters, he used the hope that he had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he desired paradise. So Allah forgave him. Just like those whom Allah mentioned in the Quran when they had three loaves of bread. And then a poor person came and knocked on their door. And he said to him, Miskeen, 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 I'm a poor man. So they brought out their piece of loaf and gave it to him. And then the second day, their door knocked. And then they, he said, Yatim, 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 an orphan, an orphan. And so they gave him that second loaf of bread. And then the third man came a second day and knocked on their door and he said, Asir, 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 a captive, a captive. They said, Here's a loaf of bread. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they feed their wealth out of love for Allah and desire for Jannah. An Asir, a captive, and a poor person, and an orphan. And they would say to them, we are feeding you, not wanting thanks or any reward from you. We seek the pleasure of Allah and we fear a day that will come to us on a day of judgment. Allah says, فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَرَّ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ And so Allah saved them from the bad misfits of that day. وَجَزَاهُمْ And He rewarded them بِمَا صَبَرُوا With that which they had to be patient for. نعم, Jannah requires patience, my dear brothers, and struggle. جَنَّةً وَحَرِيرًا Paradise and silk. وَدَانِيَةً عَلَيْهِمْ ظِلَالُهَا وَذُلِّلَتْ قُطُوفُهَا تَذْلِيلًا And its shade and its trees are upon them. And its fruits are easy to go, to, to, to reach. And they have palaces of gold. And they have everything they ever wished for. And they have servants who would come round to them with golden bra, with golden plates and golden cups, giving them grapes and fruit and water and drink. And we sqawna fiha ka'san kana mizajuha ka'san jabila. Aynan fiha tusamma sal sabila. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them water from a fountain which is so beautiful and tasty they have never tasted anything like it before. From a fountain called sal sabila. Naam. Jannah. Jannatun arduha as samawatu wal ard. As great and as far as the heavens and earth, as the sky and earth. And they also sacrificed their lives. This is my last story, my dear brothers and sisters. This is a story which shocked me, wallahi al-azim. 
And it is a story that existed in about the 10th century in the Islamic era. In that time, Muslims were attacking, sorry, enemies of Islam who were ruthless, were attacking the Muslims in a place called Ar Raqqa in Iraq. And they had invaded the homes and raped the women and stole their children and killed the old men. This is in history. Because they said, Our Lord is Allah. After doing so, there was a man at that time who existed. He was a great scholar and a great leader in battles. His only cause and motive was to defend the Muslims wherever they may be, wherever they were killed or oppressed. His name was Abu Qudama. This man Abu Qudama was once, and he was very courageous, he was once sitting in the masjid when a group of people came up to him and they said to him, Ya Abu Qudama, we have free time right now. Can you tell us of an amazing story that happened during your time? We want to hear the most unusual and surprising story ever to be heard. Can you entertain us, Ya Abu Qudama, and make us come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then Abu Qudama sat for a while and gathered them. When everyone was silent, like you are right now, he said to them, I recall one of the most shocking stories that ever happened. Until today, I don't know how to explain it. He said, one time I went to that place, Ar Raqqa in Iraq. And I stood up in the mosques and I went out to the city where there were young Muslims to recruit soldiers who are ready to defend the borders of Ar Raqqa, to stand guard over there. And if the enemy attacks, to be strong enough to defend the women and the children. As Allah says in the Quran, what is wrong with you, O believers, that you do not go and fight in the cause of Allah when the weak and feeble people are calling out, O oh Allah, send people to save us. We are responsible for the weak ones. Whoever and whenever, wherever they may be. And so he began to recruit people. Only a few gathered with him. And so he began to ask for some wealth and money. After the day had ended, he rented a small apartment, a little place to stay in. He said, I went into this place and I stayed there. And then just after Isha, when I was praying my night prayer, I was about to pray my witr. When all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, everything is quiet. You can hear the crickets outside when my door began to knock. I said, Subhanallah, nobody knows me here. I've just arrived yesterday and already my door is knocking. Yani someone's knocking at my door. He said, so I slowly went and opened the door. And in front of me there stood a woman. I could not see her face because she had covered all of her body, everything. And while she was covering her hand, she reached out her hand. And before she opened it, she asked, are you the man who was calling out for recruitment today? Were you the man who was gathering wealth in order to go and guard our borders and protect us? He said, yes. You were the one who was calling to jihad. He said, yes, I am the one. So she said, please open your, arm, your hand. And he opened his hand and she dropped a piece of cloth which was wrapped up into his hand. And he said, take this, it is an amana. It is a trust. And she ran off. That's all she said. I wanted to ask her many other questions, but she had no reply. So I went inside and I opened that cloth and I found a piece of paper with something written on it and a thick lock of hair. I read the paper and the paper said, Today you were calling out for recruitments to fight with you and protect the weak people. I am a woman and unable to fight. And I don't have enough wealth to give you. So my heart was struck with shock and sorrow when I did not find anything to give you. So I went home and cut a lock of my hair. And that is the one you see in this cloth. The only thing which I can give to the cause of this 
is my lock of hair. I ask you to please use it as your rein. Yani the rope that would steer the horse. So that maybe Allah will recognize this and know that I was fighting with you in that jihad. Even though taking a lock of a hair of a Muslim woman, giving it to a man is not allowed in Islam. But her jihad spirit reached that stage. She couldn't stop herself. She said, and tomorrow someone will come to you. He is a recruitment. See if he is worthy. And that is it. He said, subhanallah, what kind of a woman is this? He said, so I took the lock of hair and I did put it onto my reins. And I, the next morning I gathered the troops and we went out in the, into the battlefield. <clears throat> when we reached the battlefield, you near the borders, we noticed that a group of army after a day began to make their way towards us. And so I got the army ready and I told them to stand guard. As we were about to move forward, I heard a voice from a far distance calling out, Ya Ammi Aba Qudama, Ya Ammi Aba Qudama, intadhirni, wait for me, my uncle. He looked back and he found a fierce warrior on his horse galloping fiercely towards him. And he had his face covered like this. As soon as this man approached him, Abu Qudama looked at him and said, how can I help you? He said, wait for me. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, who has written for me to meet you and unite with you. He said, calm down, calm down and take a bit of breath. He said, you don't understand. I made a dua all my life to have this opportunity. And I thought that you were going to beat me. Allah, this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that I was going to unite with you. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. He said, ask me, what do you want? He said, I want to fight with you. I want to have part in this. And then Abu Qudama said to him, show me your face. I want to know who you are. And then he reluctantly took the cloth off his face. And Abu Qudama said, and I looked at his face and before me was the most beautiful face that I'd ever laid eyes on. The face of a young man, about 17 or 18 years of age. His face was like the full moon in its brightness. And I noticed that he was young. And I said, son, what experience do you have? How can you come and fight with us? No, you are not allowed to come and fight with us. You are too young. Return back. And he said, but my mother came to you last night. He said, your mother? He said, yes, my mother. He said, who is your mother? And he said, she's the one that gave you a lock of her hair. And she told you to look after me. He said, is that your mother? He said, naam. He said, you should go back and look after her son. Don't come here and fight. And he started to hold on to him, the young boy. And he said to him, no, Abu Qudama, no, no. My father fought in jihad and I want to fight too. I want to defend. Please accept me. I have great experience. I have fought many battles and I'm an experienced horse rider. I'm a really good experienced person. Wallahi, you will find me that I'm able to help you a lot. When he insisted on him and he insisted on him, Abu Qudama looked at him and he said to him, okay, if you are insisting on traveling along with us, then you have to stand in the last line. And your work is to prepare food for the soldiers. He said, fair enough. I'll do that. So they went out. And sorry, the enemy wasn't approaching, but they, got, they, they had news of the enemy approaching. And so the time of lunch came, and the soldiers wanted to eat. And he sent out this young man, his name was Muhammad, to go out and prepare the meal. And then when about one or two hours passed, no food had arrived. Abu Qudama said, so I went searching for him and thought what had kept him so long. And when I arrived, I found the pot was boiling in front of him and he was asleep beside it. I said, subhanallah, 
He must be very tired. Because, he said, during the whole day, all I saw him was he was the most active amongst all the men. He would race after this one and race after that one, and help this person, help that person. He was very active during the day. I became amazed how, how agile this young boy is, how enthusiastic this young man is. And so I thought, I felt sorry for him, and I thought maybe he needs some rest. So I did not interfere, and I did not disturb him. And I began to prepare and finish and complete off the meal myself. But as I was stirring, he said, I heard a small sound coming from him. So I looked immediately at him, and all of a sudden, I see his face begin to smile. He's asleep. After a few moments, the smile grew. A few moments later, his teeth began to show. And then even a few moments later, he began to laugh in laughter and giggle. As he was laughing, his laughter began to intensify until finally he awoke. Suddenly. And he saw me in front of him with open eyes. And his smile immediately failed. Um, immediately faded away as though he was shocked that I was there in front of him and he did not want me to be there as though he had a secret and then I said and then he 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 got up immediately and he said yeah me I'm sorry I didn't know that I had gone to sleep please you don't have to prepare the food please let me Abu Qadama said no you sit down wallahi I will not let you do anything until you tell me why were you laughing he said I was laughing he said, yes, you were laughing. Your laughter could reach a few meters away. He said, Abu Qadama, since you saw me laughing and you won't let me go, I will tell you what I was dreaming about. But you have to keep it a secret between you and I. For if I tell you, maybe Allah will not accept my reward of coming here. Maybe it will be insincere. He said, please tell me. He said, I'm listening with open ears. I really want to know what he was seeing in his dream. And then the young boy said, I slept and then I noticed as if the last hour had come. The world ended. And the day of judgment came. Everybody was looking up into the sky. And then all of a sudden, I hear a voice calling out, grab Muhammad and take him to paradise. Amongst everyone, a light came to me, a light, and took me away. And then there was a man next to me, a very handsome man. His light emanated from his face till it reached the far corners of what I could see. And he took me into Jannah. And I asked him, who are you? And he said, I am one of your servants, which Allah has made for you in Jannah, in your palace. And he said, where are you taking me? This is when he began to smile. He said, I am taking you to your wealth and to your family, and to your belongings and possessions in your palace in Jannah. And so his smile grew more. And then when he reached the great gates and the great doors of his large possession, he said, I cannot enter here, for you have women inside, and I am not allowed to set eyes upon them. His smile grew more. And so he entered. He said, and then I found many beautiful women their light was so great that I thought if they were to relieve, to, see, to show themselves on earth, they would light the whole earth. And they grabbed my, my arm and took me away. And I thought, are you my wives? And they said, no, 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 we are just your servants. But you have your princess waiting inside Al Khidr, inside the tent, reclining on her silk sheets, waiting for you. And so I entered, and all of a sudden I see a woman which almost made my heart escape, made my soul escape from my body. And I said to her, Who are you? And a smile grew when his teeth began to show. And she said, I am the one whom Allah promised you. I am your wife in Jannah. I am the one who Allah gift wrapped it for you. وَمَا تَدْرِي مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ And no mu'min knows what Allah has gift wrapped for them in Jannah. Even for the women. And then 
he said he came to extend his arm and touch her and then she grabbed his arm and returned it back gently and she said to him no ya Muhammad not now I ask Allah to save you from any bad acts I am not yours yet and it is because you have saved yourself from haram acts with other women Allah gave me to you so keep yourself pure ya Muhammad and our, our meeting is tomorrow and we shall break our fast together because Muhammad used to fast every day one day on and one day off and then he said when she was speaking to me I began to laugh and I really wanted to approach her and she would say no ya Muhammad not now no ya Muhammad not now and I began to laugh and laugh until I woke up that is my story ya Ammi Abu Qudama please keep it a secret between you and me otherwise my rewards will be gone he said it's my secret he said Abu Qudama I kept my eyes watching this young boy the next day the army the enemy arrived it was fierce and we attacked and charged I looked behind me where Muhammad was supposed to be standing and all of a sudden he was right in the front and he did not have any experience in fighting because he could not hold his sword Muhammad had deceived Abu Qudama in saying to him he has experience he said I could not reach him anymore but he was right in the front line and he would call out the message of his mother Ya ibni idha laqeetahum fala tuwallihim duburak if you meet them then do not run away and show them your back he would call out like that Allahu Akbar and he would fight whoever would fight him he would fight whoever would hold the sword against him and against the Muslims he would protect that person and then that person until finally Abu Qudama said dust grew so much in my eyes and I lost sight of him I did not know where he was finally Allah gave us victory because we were fighting for a noble cause and at the end of the victory we started looking for our martyrs and then I just wanted to find Muhammad the young boy I did not care about anyone else I kept searching and searching when all of a sudden I see at a distance a young boy holding out his arm and saying Ammi, Ammi and I could barely hear him so I ran to him as fast as I could and I grabbed his beautiful head as though he was my son and I looked at her face at a face that was once youthful at a face that was once beautiful at a face that was so handsome and a body that was so young and strong the horses had trampled him the wheels had crushed his bones his face his face was indescribable and he was holding a piece of his shirt which was ripped and he was taking deep breaths dying and then Abu Qudama held his face and he began to cry he said my son I told you that the war is very fierce didn't I tell you that the battle is not what you think didn't I tell you and didn't I tell you that you are still young I told you my son and you had to go forward why have you done this to yourself and he looked at him and he said to him Ammi Abu Qudama this is what my mother raised me for my father died for this cause as well. Do you want me to do you want to deny me? And you of all people, Ya Ammi Abu Qudama, you are telling me to go back when Allah says in the Quran, and what do you fear when fighting in his cause? He said to him, Ya Ammi, this is what I want. Wallahi, I could see my palaces in front of me. If only you could see what I could see, Ya Ammi. And then he said, But I require one thing of you. My mother when you reach her she'll be very saddened and she may not believe you that I have died in the cause of Allah so I want you to take this piece of my shirt and show it to her so that she can relieve her sadness and know that I am in Jannah and that what she has raised she will also be in Jannah with me let her know that do not be saddened my mother I died and you will be with me forever in eternity in Jannah my mother I died in the cause of Allah now it will be a guarantee that you will be with me and we will be together with my father he said because nothing else will calm her heart 
He said, Ya Ammi Abu Qudama, I also have a young sister. Her name is Fatima. She's only eight years old. She has grown up with me to love me so much when my father passed away. And I love her extremely. However, my Am, her love I have never seen like that before. She's too attached to me. When you reach her, please try to look after her. Please try to calm her down. Please try to say soothing words to her. For I fear her consequence. She loves me too much. And don't show her, show her my shirt. Abu Qudama promised. And then while he was holding him in his arms, young Muhammad began to smile. And his smile grew. And then it grew even more. And then even more until he began to giggle with laughter. And he said, Ya Ammi Abu Qudama, la ilaha illallah, inni la ajidul mardiyata jambi jambi. The woman that he saw in his dreams, her name was Mardiyah. Mardiyah, the pleasing one. He said, Ya Ammi Abu Qudama, look at her. She has just come down from the sky and she is lying beside me holding my hand. She's waiting for me, Ya Am. Allah sadaqani wa'dah. He gave me what he has promised. I am going to Jannah with Mardiyah. She will keep me company, Ya Ammi Abu Qudama. Our secret between you and I. And then he died while he was, do while he was biting onto his lip like this and saying to Abu Qudama, Ya Ammi, remember our secret. And he died and went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a noble death. And then Abu Qudama went back to his land, into, his, into the village in Raqqa. And all the women went out to meet the Mujahideen. And then came the mother of Muhammad, searching for him. And then she came up to Abu Qudama and she said to him, My son, where is my son? And Abu Qudama looked at her and said, He passed away. And he says, he fought in the front line without returning back and he did what you had advised him and what you trained him to do. He said, I do not believe you. I don't believe you. As, just as her son said. And then he said, but he told me to give you this shirt. And she looked at his shirt and she looked at it and examined it. And she knew that it was the blood and the stains of her young son Muhammad. And then she cried and put her arms up to Allah. And she said, Alhamdulillah, the one who has saved my son, I will now definitely be guaranteed that I will be reunited with him and my husband. But before that, Abu Qudama saw something, a young girl racing towards every man, fluttering like a butterfly, touching this man and looking at him, then touching another man and looking at him, then turning another man around and examining his face like a young child does. And Abu Qudama knew that this was Fatima looking for her brother. And so I went up to Fatima and I grabbed her and I hugged her and kissed her and I said to her, what are you looking for? And Fatima said, my brother, Muhammad, where's Muhammad? Where's Muhammad? Do you know where Muhammad is? Do you know where Muhammad is, my brother? I love him. I want to see him. And he promised me that he will return. Because Muhammad said to Abu Qudama, he said to him before he died, I promised my sister that I'm going to return, otherwise she would have never left me. But I'm not going to return. He said he promised him that he's going to come back. Where is he? Abu Qudama started to cry. And he said to him, Fatima, your brother says, Assalamu alaikum to you. And he says that soon you're going to meet him in Jannah, insha'Allah. She said, Jannah? Did he die? Abu Qudama said, Yes, but he died a noble cause before he could finish this word. Fatima took a very deep breath and she fell unconscious to the ground. He came to pick her up, but the mother raced to her and she said, leave her. And she took her daughter away and into the room. Abu Qudama knocked and knocked, but it was too late. He heard the mother inside crying and saying, Oh my Lord, my husband died for your cause and he is in Jannah, insha'Allah. My son, I have sacrificed him for you, Ya Allah, and I have raised him. Please do not, do not deny me my presence and my unity with him in Jannah. And now my daughter has passed away and followed her brother. Ya Allah, my husband, my son, and my daughter, they are all to you. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. To Allah we belong and to him we shall return. O oh Allah, guarantee me a place in Jannah with them. O oh Allah, unite me with them. And she began to cry until her voice faded away into the darkness. Abu Qudama kept knocking, but she would not open for him. He said, so I left her and I went away. Until this day, my dear companions, the story 
has remained unexplainable to me. And I do not know this, this, the, I, do, I do not know what happened after that. These, my dear brothers and sisters, were the stories of those who fight sincerely in their hearts towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These were the ones who sincerely in their hearts struggled for Jannah. Do we struggle for Jannah in any way? Are we able to sacrifice something, my dear brothers and sisters, in any way? La wallah. I see that a lot of us think about themselves before others. A lot of us think about our needs and our stomachs and our pockets before any other people. I see even more than that. Some of the Muslims today who claim to be Muslims, they say, we take riba and usury from the bank because we are in need. In need for what? They want to buy an expensive house with riba. They want to reach that objective of a hundred thousand dollars. This is their necessity. And they say they are in need thinking about the shaitan ways. We see people who do not even think about others anymore. Don't donate even a date, a date from their pockets for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are filling up petrol, forget about filling up $25. Fill up $20 and leave that $5 in donation for Sabilillah. When you buy your cigarettes, forget about paying for a cigarette today, for a box today. Leave it till tomorrow and rather put that money for donation. Donate to the causes that are ongoing, an ongoing charity, ongoing knowledge, which will benefit you in your grave. Places which encourage this and work towards it. Think about your brothers before you think about yourselves. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be, my dear brothers and sisters. In these stories there are examples. And there were wisdoms. I have left you with these wisdoms and with these examples. Allah says, فَقْصُصِلْ قَصَصَ And I end it with this. Allah says, فَقْصُصِلْ قَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ فَقُصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى And so relate the stories to them so that they may contemplate and think. Not stories that are lies, but stories of true fact that will make you come closer to Allah and into Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite us in Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us one of those who truly desire Jannah. For if you do not desire Jannah, how can you enter it? We ask Allah to save us from hellfire. Allahumma, save us from hellfire. Allahumma, we seek refuge in you from your anger. Allahumma, we ask you to let us unite and drink from the hawd, from the fountain of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, make us one of those whom the prophets and the martyrs, whom the prophets and the martyrs will envy and be jealous of on the day of judgment. They are the ones who are mutahaboon. They are the ones who love each other for the sake of Allah. Oh Allah, let us be on high towers on the day of judgment by our love for one another, through our love for one another. Allah, Allahumma la tamna'ana al-jannah. Allahumma la tamna'ana اللهم لا تمنعنا نهر الكوثر ولا تمنعنا السلسبيل ولا تمنعنا تسنيم ولا تمنعنا الفردوس الأعلى اللهم آمين I thank you for listening my dear brothers and sisters سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طيب brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Inshallah, we won't take too much of your time for questions and answers. We probably won't go through them all. Uh, I'll go through the first question. The two stories, the questioner asks, the two stories that you said, are they really true? I don't know which story, two stories, but they are all true, brother or sister. And all the other stories before were based on hadiths. Read in Rijal, Rijal Hawl al Rasul. There are also little tiny booklets which scholars have also written, a lot of tapes that talk about these things. Uh, and the last story is from a book called Al Bidaya wa Nihaya. It talks about the history of Islam. And I also heard that story from uh, a Shaykh, 
a sheikh from Riyadh. Yani it's it's a known uh, it's a known tape. It's a known story. We never tell false stories because false stories is not what a Muslim says. It's haram to tell a story which is a lie unless you tell the people it's not true. So these are true stories. Mark my words. طيب. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. It is stated <coughs> that we do not enter Jannah till after Judgment Day, and this is a known fact. I am just curious as to why so many hadiths state that certain companions have entered Jannah and meet each other there, etc. Brother or sister in Islam, first of all, not everyone enters Jannah conditionally after the Day of Judgment. There are people who beat other people to Jannah. There are people who go in without being judged at all, such as the shuhada. And did you hear the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, 70,000 of my ummah shall enter Jannah without hisab or adab, without judgment or any type of torture. So Jannah is not necessarily, you don't necessarily enter it after Judgment Day has ended. But you will go in groups. But you have to wait at the door of Jannah until the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu enters it first. That's the only difference. So the first part, it's not a fact that everyone enters Jannah after Judgment Day. But as soon as Allah descends to begin the judgment, then people start to enter afwaj and afwaja, meaning in groups. Not as soon as they are resurrected, but as soon as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu prostrates to Allah and says, and Allah then descends when his anger calms down and he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Muhammad, irfa' ra'sak, lift your head, wa Make intercession, I will give you and ask for whatever you like, I will give you. And then he says, Ya Rabbi Ummati Ummati, my nation, my nation. And then Allah begins to call out, enter such a people in and enter such a people in and so on and so on. And judgment here and judgment there. Secondly, uh, why hadiths, uh, many hadiths state about companions and others were entering Jannah as though it is speaking about the present time. Brother and sister, this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. Because to Allah, time has already passed. Did you hear the verse in the Quran where Allah says, وَإِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَأَلْفِ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ One day to Allah, is like a thousand years of what we count. And that's only one day to Allah. Everything has already happened to Allah. Secondly, Allah's knowledge of everything is already there before He began creation, before He even created the pen, before time. Allah knew. And so He speaks, Allah SWT speaks as though it is now to us, but because He does not need to say in the future. Because the future can change. But to Allah, He already knows what the future is. So He does not need to say in the future. Another question. The questioner asks, I hear you and understand you with every minute. Struggle to attain Jannah. Yes, that is one of the main point. But I have a concern. How can you struggle and want to feel this sense of poverty and struggle? If you have a family who are Muslim, but love the banks and go against everything you do, according to Deen al-Islam, and you're only so young. This is a question from a sister. May Allah reward you for having that concern. First of all, you don't need to have that sense of poverty. No. You don't need to feel poverty. No, no. This is not what the message was. Feeling poverty is one thing, but when poverty doesn't affect you is another thing. A Muslim is not affected by poverty. And in Islam, be careful. There are people who, you are, you, who have rights over you and you're responsible for to provide them with wealth first. Such as, for example, the husband is in charge of his wife and his children first and then his parents. Your sadaqah is to them first. And if you have nothing else, let it be to them. Keep that in mind. 
A person who feels poverty is a person who is afraid of poverty. Yani what I mean by that? A person who feels poverty in the sense where he is afraid of poverty is not a good feeling. Because the shaitan says, Allah says in the Quran, as shaitanu yahidukum al faqr He promises you that you're going to become poor. This is what happens to people who go to banks of riba. Why do they go there? When they say to us, it is a necessity. Do you know what that necessity is? No, they haven't ended up on the street. No, they do have a place to live in. They're renting, for example. What they're talking about is the future. One day they're going to end up on the street. They don't know what the future is. That's what the shaitan is promising them. He's promising them poverty. This type of feeling is not a good feeling. But to know that you are a little bit poor in money, ask Allah for more, there is nothing wrong with that. To want to be rich, there is nothing wrong with that. But to fear poverty, to fear the future, making you go to do haram, that's what we're talking about. Many companions struggled for Jannah and loved it, but they were rich. But they gave from their wealth their rights. You ask, your family goes to banks and you are so young, and I, extra to that, you are a sister, a female. A female often has a less effect against her father or her brothers, for example, because men these days, they have so much pride. They can't accept an advice from a child or a woman, which is quite very on the contrary in Islam. Sister, you are to do what you are able to do with your tongue, first of all with your hands. If you're able to change something with your hand, change it. If you can't, change it with your mouth. Speak good words of wisdom, like what the Prophet used to speak. <clears throat> if you can't, <clears throat> if you're unable to speak with your mouth, what I mean by that, not that if you speak to them and they don't listen, no, no, that's giving up hope. I'm saying if you can't, meaning there's something stopping you from talking. Then the Prophet Sallallahu said, then hate it in your heart. And watch out for yourself. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas alaykum bi anfusikum la yadurrukum man dalla idha tadaytum. O people, you are to be worried about yourselves. No one can harm you if you are guided. So this is what you do, sister. You are so young. Uh, youth is not a, an obstacle, insha'Allah. But try your best and earn the rewards. Be sincere to Allah, wanting Jannah. Uh, guiding someone is in the hands of Allah. It's not your decision. It's not our. It's not my. Yani, it's not my business whether someone accepts or rejects. My business is that I do my duty, and that's all that Allah asks of you. Don't stress. Don't feel. Yani, don't, don't sort of blame yourself for anything. Do your worship properly. Do your duties as far as you can, and save yourself first. Very simple. Someone has made a statement here from the sisters. <clears throat> a, word of, a word of advice to my brothers. As a teacher, I know that sometimes the young boys and girls can feel intimidated by their elders religiously, mentally and physically. I want to ask a favor. I want the young people here today not to feel shy and hold back in searching for knowledge. I want them to look at the youngest Khalifa in Islam. His name is Muhammad Al-Fatih. And take <coughs> him as an example. Constantinople, Constantinia, he opened Constantinople after the Crusaders took it. He was only 17 years of age and was the head of the Muslim Ummah. I urge all of you to find out the story and from and, and search for more like him and maybe one day become like him, insha'Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Ummah, Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, pious and loving to one another. Somebody once asked me, how do you think the Muslims will become or what they would come to? I answered, look at its youth. Change for Jannah. Jazakallah khairan wa iyyakum. And yes, as though this person took the words out of my mind and spoke them. Also another question. The questioner asks, I have been practicing Islam for three years now and I wore hijab, which is in the past tense. But I have taken my hijab off eight months ago. I can't handle it. Will I enter paradise? A person to ask this question means, just by asking that question, 
means that they are concerned about what Allah thinks of them. This is the first step to a sister wearing her hijab in the beginning. Not just hijab, first step to praying, first step to uh, fasting, first step to donating, all of these things. To recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you ask this question, it means that you are concerned about what Allah thinks. So alhamdulillah, this is good. Just because of that, and I can't really answer if you're entering Jannah. I can't say that I'm entering Jannah. Muhammad sallallahu himself said, Wallahi, no one will enter Jannah without the mercy of Allah. They said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. They said, not even I. Only if Allah wants to give me mercy. So no one can guarantee Jannah. And I cannot judge who enters Jannah and who enters Hellfire. Even if you didn't wear the hijab. But what I can say is this. Keep Allah in your mind and realize your Tawheed. When you ask Allah and you ask, is Allah going to punish me or not? It means that you believe in Allah. Which means that insha'Allah you will enter Jannah. Insha'Allah. Every Muslim will enter Jannah. Every Muslim who never died with shirk will enter Jannah. But I have to say what the Prophet ﷺ said in general, not to the questioner herself or himself. Herself, because this is a hijab woman. The Prophet ﷺ and Allah say in, says in the Quran, إِن تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْهَوْنَ عَنْهُ نُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَنُدْخِلْكُمْ مُدْخَلًا كَرِيمًا If you can guarantee that she, or if you avoid the major sins, I will pardon you from all the minor sins and let you enter Jannah without any punishment. The Prophet ﷺ also says, any person who dies with a major sin, his matter is to Allah. أَمْرُهُ إِلَى Allah." And then he says, each major sin has a punishment. Wherever the Prophet ﷺ says, talks about a punishment or a wa'id from Allah, know that it is a major sin. Since you ask me about hijab, then I say to you that through hadith and dalil, hijab is fard. It's compulsory. Because commanded in the Quran and commanded on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari and Muslim and Turmud in Abu Dawood and in Nisa'i, Al Bayhaqi, and other books. Hijab is fard, just like salat is fard. And whoever abandons a fard, of course hijab is less than, than, than the prayer, but it is a fard still. Whoever abandons a fard which Allah has commanded, compulsory, then there is a punishment for that. Whether Allah punishes the woman who takes off a hijab or doesn't is his concern. A woman who was a prostitute, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, entered Jannah because she gave a dog water to drink, but she believed in Allah. So who am I to say that a woman who doesn't wear hijab specifically will not enter? But I say that the Prophet ﷺ said, رَأَيْتُ I saw in Jahannam people لَمْ أَرَهُنَّ مِنْ قَبْلُ قط. I never saw of them or never known of them before. Nisa'un, women. They are clothed, but at the same time, they are still naked. They move from side to side in temptation, tempting men, seductive walks, showing their bodies. Their heads are shaped and fashioned. Yeah, and they like palm trees or humps. You know, this is a fashion. لا يدخلن الجنة ولا يجدن ريحها. They will not enter paradise, and they will not be able to smell its fragrance. وإن ريحها لا يوجد من مسافة كذا وكذا. And although the fragrance of paradise can be smelt from distance of so and so, this means that the woman who doesn't wear her hijab and Allah only knows again. In general, Allah only knows of her state. She will not enter Jannah in the beginning when Allah says enter Jannah. But rather she will be detained. Or she will be punished in whatever means Allah knows of. In hellfire. And then she will be saved because of the intercession of the Prophet Now this is in general. This is by default. As you can say. 
But then again, we cannot say who enters and who doesn't. Yani, there was an old woman who was bad to her neighbors. And the, Prophet, and the companions asked him, Ya Rasulullah, she prays a lot and she fasts a lot and donates a lot. In, in the night she prays, but she's bad character to her neighbors. He said, La khayra fiha innaha fin nar. There is no good from her, she is in fire. They said, her neighbor is another woman who doesn't pray as much, doesn't donate as much, but she is good to her neighbors and to people, as Allah commanded. He said, innaha fil jannah. She is in jannah. Another woman entered hellfire because she trapped a cat. She didn't feed it, nor did she let it go out to eat from what Allah provided her. Yani, only Allah knows really specifically who enters and who doesn't. But in general, you are in danger. In general, the brothers as well, I'm sorry about that to say, who shave their beards are also in danger. You are at risk, risking it. Yani, it's like when a person passes a red light, drives past a red light. You are at risk. Either there is a camera, or a police may see you, or you may be reported, or you may not. You may get away with it. A person who shaves their beard of the men, it is a fard. And a woman who takes off her hijab, which is also a fard. You are placing yourself at risk, my dear brothers and sisters. Don't place yourself in risks. Another question. Is it permissible to pluck your eyebrows? Just clean it up, not remove the whole thing. My eyebrows, as a man, I'm not allowed to pluck them either. So what about the woman? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَعَنَ اللَّهَ النَّامِصَ وَالْمُتَنَمِّصَ Allah curses the woman who plucks her eyebrows and the woman who plucks them for her. وَالْوَاشِمَ وَالْمُسْتَوْشِمَ And the woman who tattoos another woman, the woman who, does, who, who gets it tattooed for herself. And the woman who files her teeth or makes them wider in order to look nicer just for nothing like that she is cursed so you said pluck your eyebrows then you said just clean it up not remove the whole thing well cleaning up involves plucking so if remove if cleaning up involves plucking then it's the same thing sister isn't it or brother however i would like to relieve you with one thing in a case of extreme necessity, you're allowed to pluck your eyebrows, such as if you are, happen to be a woman, and this is very rare, a woman, obviously, who has abnormal eyebrows. Then Allah does not oppress you. He allows you to pluck enough to look, make them look normal. Not to pluck them to make them look like models ink or something. And also, you're allowed to pluck between the eyebrows. Right? In the Arabic term, the eyebrows are the ones directly above the eyes. So you can clean up what's above your nose. But above the eye, this is a, something which Allah takes offense to. Because as though you are altering Allah's creation, altering Allah's art. Yeah. So be careful of that. Khalas? Ten minutes. Lots of the brothers go to watch the football. Allah is a uh, I've advised my husband not to go, but he doesn't listen. I don't feel it's a place for Muslims. The music is very loud, the cheerleaders, etc. are going off. I'm an extremely jealous wife. I believe I have this right. Please advise my husband and brothers. May Allah reward you, Jannah. Jazakumullahu khayran. Okay, I'll split it into little sections, because some things I agree and some things I don't. Um, lots of brothers go to watch uh, the football. <coughs> I don't think a lot of them do, inshallah. I, as far as I know, I think a lot of them, yeah, a lot of them do actually, yeah, but not the religious ones. I'm talking about the religious ones. But uh, if you do go to the football, first of all, brothers and sisters, yani, obviously it's a haram environment because there's music and cheerleaders, just like there is on television or in the market or anywhere else that you go. The only difference is that when you go for a necessity and music has to be there and you can't avoid it, that's different to when you go directly to the football and you know that the environment is not um, good over there. You get a person who's sitting next to you drinking alcohol and going off his head. Women uh, sitting next to you and also screaming foul language when they're very 
It shows more. And the man loves to look at that, you know. I mean, a lot of men who have evil hearts, yeah, I mean, they go there, some of them, to have that pleasure. I mean, when you ask them, why can't you just watch it on television? They say, no, we have to go there because we have to live the moment and scream. That's what one person said to me. He goes, brother, what do you think I go there? I, go, I can't hear anything. I can't really see what's going on down there. But I love to scream and swear at this player and swear at that player, just like everyone else. F you and F this and F that. No, this is what happens. It's a place of fahisha. Avoid the places which the shaitan hangs around in, my dear brothers. Now it says here as well, I, uh, I, have extreme, I am an extremely jealous wife. <clears throat> I have to comment on that, my dear sister, because uh, one of the problems that can exist between a relationship is being too jealous, yani un unnecessarily. Yani there has to be trust between each other. If there's no trust, there's really no relationship. And I emphasize this, Wallahi al-Azim. There has to be trust. And by him going to the footy, yani, is not taking your right away, no. If he provides you with other time, he's not taking your right away. He's actually taking his own right away. By placing himself in a place which Allah hates. Don't have extreme jealousy. Tune it down a bit, tone it down a bit, inshaAllah. Because if you have extreme jealousy, goodness, it'll only get worse. And you're living in Australia here, it's, it'll only even get even worse and worse and worse. And yani there will be times where your husband, your husband's probably completely innocent and you will uh, slander him with things that he is innocent of. And on a day of judgment, he may complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about you. Are you willing to take that risk? However, say you, are, you know you're halal and haram and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the best. You know, if, uh, if you don't want me as a wife, inshallah, you know, there are other means. But if you want me as a wife, Alhamdulillah, you know, you've, Alhamdulillah, I will protect you and help protect you from hellfire and so on. And I tell you a story about Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Uh, a man, a man uh, was in his house and uh, his wife began to shout, you know, disrespectfully to him, which is really not good from a woman. It's, it's something which Allah really hates. She, but she screamed and she's weak. So he went to complain to Umar radiallahu anhu. What's he going to do? As soon as he came close to his house, he heard Umar ibn Khattab's wife yelling. And then he tried to walk away, but Umar ibn Khattab went out and, and caught him. He said, you've come for something. He said, no, no, it's okay. He said, no, Allah, you're going to ask me, I'm going to help you. He said, well, this is my state. And I, when I found that your state is like that, I thought, well, who am I? So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said to him this. This is how they thought. And this is how you men should think as well. He said, Inna zawjati. She is my partner in life. She washes my clothes. She looks after my children. She prepares my meals. She guards my chest. She guards my secrets behind me. And she saves me from hellfire. Yani, my temptations don't take me in a haram place. Meaning, if you know a bad thing about her, think about all the other good things that she has. But jealousy, my dear sister and brothers, Wallahi. Most jealousies, most of them, if not all of them, lead to divorce. If not divorce, you'll have a very ugly life. Turn down the jealousy. Yes, be jealous, but not that, not that much. Not that much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum assalam. The men get... The men get... <clears throat> ah, the men get hur al -ayn. Do women get something similar? And can they change their minds about the man they are with? So do they have multiple choices? Please advise. I'm sure this sister Yani asked it out of pure intention, inshallah, because we consider that when a sister asks this question, uh, you know, you're still in this life, you're not in Jannah yet, and you're already desiring multiple choices. You know what I mean? So be careful about that. Now, you asked if you can get uh, hur men in Jannah, in other words. Uh, yes, I think you can, because Ibn al-Qaim ibn Taymiyyah comment about that. And they said, because Allah says in the Qur'an, لَهُمْ مَا تَشْتَهِ أَنفُسُهُمْ Whatever their soul desires and tempts for. And Allah did not place conditions. So, inshaAllah, you may get your man in Jannah. If you don't want your husband um, that you are with, I don't know, Allahu A'lam. But what I can say to you is this. In Jannah, Allah satisfies everyone. Satisfaction. What do you want more than that? You're completely satisfied. And you wish for things and you wish and you wish until finally there's no more wishes. 
and you are completely satisfied. Allah gives you ideas more and more and more and then He shows you Himself. So inshallah you'll be satisfied, don't worry. Another question, if a person misses on some prayers purposely out of laziness but have a great fear of Allah and death as they are as they or will they be the dwellers of heaven Allah Akbar and if they have fear of Allah inshallah they will enter Jannah they will yani, by not praying one prayer out of laziness or two or three doesn't make you a dweller of hellfire forever you may be punished purposefully yes there is a sin for it but there is always tawbah and read listen to Ahmad the repenter you will know what I'm talking about in Tawbah. Do we have to follow a madhab? Brothers, why don't you read the questions before you give them to me? <laughs> Sorry about that. Do we have to follow the madhab or can we use our own intellect to understand the Quran and the Sunnah? Um, what? It bad. I don't understand the last part. But in general, <coughs> yes, you can follow a madhab. Who said you can't? Yani. People who study in Medina, Munawar, or any Sharia school, they grab a certain madhab and they teach it. For example, in Medina, they study the Hanbali madhab. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayh, was a Maliki. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah, was a Maliki. However, there's a small difference, and you know what I'm about to say. Nobody, no one, not a single being, no matter how knowledge they are, how knowledgeable they are, is to be followed blindly without some investigations, with whatever you have ability to investigate in. So if you are an old grandmother who does not know how to read and write, doesn't understand anything but goats and sheep as she was raised, then it is sufficient for her for a sheikh who is trustworthy and seems to be sincere. And you can see the signs on him. And he constantly says Quran and Sunnah Hadith for her just to say, Ya Sheikh, is this allowed? And he says, yes, that's it, that's enough for her. However, someone, I give an example of myself, for example, I consider myself a student of knowledge, and I'm able to read Arabic and research in some hadiths and read what scholars have commented on certain hadiths that are fabricated and so on. I have to go to that length. Where I stop, I stop. And then I choose a certain, yani, if, I, if, if it's not clear, and it's yani, rare to be not clear, if it's something is very unclear and there is a, a, uh, yani, a, uh, a difference of opinion then you follow what your heart is content with to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you can go back to the madhab until you find something which is greater evidence yani, if I come to you right now and I say a hadith and this hadith is sahih and it's in Bukhari and it's very clear as the sun and you have understood it and then you say to me but my madhab says something else so I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to follow that. Then my dear brother or sister, yani unfortunately, and with, I say it as it is, you have made that madhab your prophet. You have made Malik or Hanbali or Abu Hanifa your prophet. Because they themselves are innocent from that. They say, don't, don't follow us blindly. If the hadith is, is sahih and sah, then it is our madhab. This is what we've been trying to do, which means that they lack some knowledge. Sometimes not all the hadiths have, have been brought to them. In time of Bukhari, he was after Imam Abu Hanifa, for example. There were hadiths he, he discovered that still existed and were sahih, and they didn't know of them. So it's not a condition, my dear sisters and brothers. He says, Salam alaikum wa alaikum salam. What do you propose as to how, how we Muslims should keep up the enthusiasm for, um, for new deen? Uh, always recite the Quran and try to understand it every day have a wird which means some type of a dhikr which you always say or have 10 minutes a day or half an hour a day where you read the Quran and try to understand it. make times in your day for Allah if you don't make a certain time in a day for Allah you will forget Allah and your enthusiasm will go down even if you pray when you pray, because prayer can come an automatic thing, a mechanical thing, and you don't know why you're praying and what you've just done or how many rukas you've done anyway. You need to always, always try to also learn new things. Read. Ask. Be around religious people as much as you can. And 
be around religious people as much as you can, make dua. Try to always, and, and if all of that doesn't work, go back to the basics. The basic of how, of what makes a Muslim, of what makes a person a Muslim. And that is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us make a time in the night or in the day to just spend time to think about Allah's creation, contemplate about how the stars are up there, subhanAllah, or about how the earth moves, or watching a video about uh, birds and things like that and, and, and sort of learn how to um, how Allah's creation is. I remembered birds because Abu Hamza, who was sitting here, has a tape about birds and I really want to watch it. I've been at his house for two days and he hasn't put it on for me. Maybe tomorrow, inshallah. And uh, so, the creation of Allah. Think about it, contemplate about it. It'll make your iman firm again. Wallah, it'll do something to your heart. You'll feel that tingle inside your heart as soon as you do it. Investigate and, tr and keep moving and looking and striving iman goes up and iman goes down don't worry so long as you're still in your compulsory things how can the muslim show the non-believers that islam is a complete way of life any spiritually politically uh, inshallah we'll, we'll sit together and we'll discuss this inshallah everything has its own way but really i i try to say to you try if and and concentrate on tawhid when you talk to them allah's oneness and you show them the good character from yourself it depends what the non-Muslim is talking about. Another question. Are all the good dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I saw that I was taken... Okay, this is a dream that I have to interpret. Uh, I'm not good at doing it, brothers and sisters. But uh, let's go for it. I saw that I was taken to a higher level where there was a tree so big it covered the scene. A beautiful man approached me and said, Come. I then inquired of someone. What about such and such? He then replied, You may intercede for 70 others. Subhanallah, could this mean what I presume at all or not? This was shown to me exactly after Fajr prayer and I had returned from Hajj. Give me your interpretation, brother, please, so that I too may have hope. I wish you I was in your place, my dear brother. This is, of course, certainly a dream from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maybe this does mean what you are thinking. Another question. Every lecture I go, I go to, I hear about men and the women of heaven that they get. And as you know, Allah has created the women with jealousy and it is sometimes hard to think about your husband with beautiful women in heaven. Will the woman also have handsome men and also what advice can you give to a woman who is very jealous of her um, of her husband?